This is a beautiful auditorium. <laughs> and thank you all very much for being here. And let me thank uh, President uh, Gertler for inviting me. And let me thank Premier Wynn for that very, very generous introduction. In fact, she gave half of my speech, so I'm going <laughs> to make it a bit shorter. And I want to thank the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, the North American Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, the Wellesley Institute, and Women's College Hospital for coming together to put this event on. I want to thank Ed Broadband and the uh, Broadband Institute for the great work uh, they are doing, uh, and you'll hear from Ed in, in a little while. Uh, finally, um, let me thank Dr. Danielle Martin, and the Premier uh, mentioned her, uh, who has helped not only make this event possible, uh, but more importantly, uh, she was kind enough to come down to Capitol Hill a little over a month ago uh, to stand with 16 of my U.S. Senate colleagues to help us introduce what we call a Medicare for All single-payer bill, which finally will allow the United States of America to do what every other major country on earth is doing, and that is guarantee health care to all as a right, not a privilege. <laughs> now, politics is tough stuff. And there are a lot of powerful special interests who are not content to make billions of dollars in profit. There are individuals in the United States not content to be worth 50 or 100 billion dollars. They want more and more and more. And they are prepared to step on anybody and everybody to get their way. Now, what one might think, and the Premier made the point, that we should be looking, all of us should be looking, Canadian health care system, not perfect, British National Health Service, not perfect, no country in the world has all of the answers and never will, as technology changes, as needs change. And sensible policies, and the President of this university made the point, we look all over the world. And we ask the hard questions. Is it working better there? What can we do to make our system better? Right now in the United States of America, as many of you know, we have 28 million Americans who have no health insurance, none whatsoever. We have what you don't know is even more than that, people who have high deductibles and high co-payments who are underinsured, which means that when they get ill, and I know it is a bit hard for Canadians to understand that, but when they get ill, they do not and cannot go to the doctor because they don't have enough money to pay for the deductibles or the copayments. Maybe it's 50 bucks, maybe it's 30 bucks. They don't have that money. And as a result, when they get their symptom, when they're ill, they hesitate going, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And I have talked to too many doctors in my state of Vermont and all over this country who tell me that there are times when people walk into their offices so ill that, in fact, their situation is terminal unnecessarily. They could have been dealt with if they came in when they should have. And the truth is not widely discussed in America that we lose thousands and thousands of people every single year unnecessarily because they don't go to the doctor when they should. In terms of Dr. Martin, she came to Washington not only to help us initiate a Medicare for All program, she was there earlier. And we had her on a panel when I was chairman of a subcommittee. And one of my Republican colleagues started to do what is often done, not tell the truth about the Canadian health care system, or not tell the truth about systems all over the world. And he started in his line of argument 
And Dr. Martin did not take those attacks lying down. She stood up, she fought back, she refuted them point by point. And 31 million people And 31 million people have seen that video on Facebook, and literally not just in the United States, not just in Canada, but all over the world. So Dr. Martin, thank you very much. Now I'm here to talk obviously about health care, but I think as the Premier indicated, when you talk about health care, you're not just talking about health care, you're talking about history, how we got to where we are today. You're talking about values, because how a society deals with health care is more than medicine, it's more than technology. It is about the values that those societies hold dear. In 1945, after the horrible suffering of World War II, uh, the British Labour Party won a landslide victory in the United Kingdom. And there was a man named Nye Bevan, not all that well known around the world today. He had been at the age of 13 a coal miner in Wales. His father was a coal miner. He dropped out of school. He went into the mines at the age of 13. And from that he became involved in the trade union movement, became involved in the British Labour Party, and in 1945 he was named to be Minister of Health in that government, Labour government. And he said upon assuming that position that within one year, one year, every person in the United Kingdom would have health care as a right. And on July 5th, 1948, in an historic moment for modern civilization, he cut a ribbon. The hospitals and the doctor's offices throughout the United Kingdom became available to all without any cost to the patient. And he laid out three principles for the national health system. One, that it meet the needs of everyone. Two, that it be free at the point of delivery. Three, that it be based on clinical need, not ability to pay. Closer to home, and I know you know this story, uh, here in Canada in 1947, Tommy Douglas. So I gather you know who Tommy Douglas is. <laughs> he was the, as you all know, the premier of Saskatchewan. And in 1947, he introduced the Saskatchewan Hospital Services Plan, the first universal, universal hospital insurance program in North America. In 1959, he announced a Medicare plan for his province, which became law a few years later, and as you all know, became the uh, model for the Canadian healthcare system. Saskatchewan was the first place in North America to guarantee health care to all people regardless of their income. And that was another historic day. Now my point about mentioning Bevan and Douglas is to point out that their work did not happen in an accident. It wasn't the case of Nye Bevan saying, you know, I, I kind of think it's a good idea to have health care for all. He came into office as a result of a landslide victory of the Labour Party where working people all over Great Britain looked around them and said that human dignity demands that all people have health care. 
He did what the people of his country wanted him to do. And the same thing in Saskatchewan. It wasn't Tommy Douglas saying, hey, I have a great idea. I woke up you know, last night, I got a dream, and this is a good idea. He was able to implement his program because his political party at that point, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, won 47 out of 52 seats in the Saskatchewan's legislature in 1944. Point being here that real change and the change in the UK and the change in Saskatchewan is very real change. It never happens from the top on down. Real change always happens from the bottom on up. And as all of you know, that change never takes place Easily, Frederick Douglass, the great American leader of the abolitionist movement, always reminded us that freedom is never given to you. If it's given to you, it's not real freedom. You gotta struggle for it, you gotta fight for it, you gotta take it. And that is the history of all real change in this world. It's the history of the workers' movement, of working people working under terrible, horrendous conditions in my country, all over the world, working 60, 70 hours a week, where you had children of 10 or 11 years of age working in factories, working in the fields where workers could be arbitrarily fired for any reason that their boss gave. And workers stood together, and they were beaten, and sometimes killed, sometimes jailed, because they said, Working people are entitled to basic human rights. We will have unions. We will have collective bargaining. And that is the history of the civil rights movement. I was just talking to uh, Dr. Claudia Fagan, who came here with me from Chicago, talked about Martin Luther King's great speech, which I happened to be at during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And what people must understand about the civil rights movement in America, it wasn't just Dr. King, as great as he was, as great a leader as he was, extraordinary leader. It had been going on for a hundred years from people who stood up were beaten, were lynched, who demanded that in America we end racism. And many of those heroes and heroines, we will never know who they were. But when Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, signed the Civil Rights Act in 1965, that was the result of people at the grassroots level for many, many decades. The same thing with the women's movement. Women fought and died a hundred years ago today in the United States of America. Women did not have the right to vote. They got a divorce, they didn't have property rights. Women and their male allies said, excuse me, that is not acceptable. Women will not continue to be second class citizens. And at the grassroots level, people stood up and fought back. And that's the history of the gay rights movement where people again said, we will not be humiliated we will not be ashamed because of our sexual orientation. We are human beings. We are human beings and we will have the right to love whomever we want. And that is the history of the environmental movement when very courageous people looked out around them and saw the terrible things that were happening to our environment decades and decades ago. And that is our mission today. Our mission is to have the courage to ask the questions that may not be appearing on television tonight or in the front pages of the paper. To ask the questions that take on the incredibly powerful special interests 
who will have so much power in my country, your country, and all over the world, to ask a simple question whether we find it acceptable that the six wealthiest people in the world today own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the world's population. <laughs> to ask a question which very few in my country will ask, whether it is acceptable in the United States that we have more income and wealth inequality than any major country on earth with a top one-tenth of one percent now owning almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent and where over 50 percent of all new income in the last number of years is going to the one percent. And a lot of people are uncomfortable about asking those questions because you know you're taking on very powerful special interest. You're taking on campaign donors people who might contribute to the university, and you kind of step back. <laughs> and that not, no, I wasn't talking about, I don't know anything about this university, I know all about universities <laughs> all over my country. All right. But those are the tough issues. Take it on the fossil fuel industry. and telling them that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of our planet. Way back in 1944, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of our great presidents, gave a State of the Union speech, which historically has received relatively little attention. And in that speech, he introduced a new concept to American politics. A very radical concept indeed. And what he said in so many words, he said, look, we in the United States have a great constitution, and we do, and we are very proud of that. And we have a great bill of rights, which says that you have freedom of speech, you have freedom of religion, you have freedom of assembly, that newspapers have a right to publish anything they want to publish. And of course, we are getting, trying to get Donald Trump to read the Constitution of the United <laughs> States, but. <laughs> but he said, and all of that is very, very important. But then he said something else. And he said that we have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. And then he continued, he said, among these economic rights are the right to adequate medical care and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security, end of quote. What was he talking about? What he was saying is, of course, all of us believe in the right of freedom of speech, the right to vote for the candidate you want to vote for, the right to publish what you want to publish. That's inherent in all of our democratic societies. But he asked the question, how free are you if you are 70 years of age in the United States of America and you cannot afford the prescription drugs you need to stay alive? How free are you if you're a single mom trying to raise your kid with dignity and you're making 11 bucks an hour? How free are you if you're one of the 28 million Americans who cannot afford to go to the doctor when you get sick because you have no health insurance? 
And that is a very important debate that we need to have. What does freedom mean? And to my mind, when we talk about human freedom, it's not just the right to vote, but it is the right to live in security and dignity with a decent job, decent educational opportunities, health care as a right, and live in an environment which is clean and which is not being destroyed by climate change. And in the United States, 21 years after Roosevelt gave his speech, Lyndon Johnson won a landslide victory in 1964 after President Kennedy, of course, was assassinated. And in 1965, Johnson signed legislation creating what we call Medicare, which is a public health insurance program for people 65 or older. And at the same time, he signed a program called Medicaid, which provides health care to lower income people. And what is very interesting when we think about the debate going on all over the world in terms of austerity efforts, et cetera, is that the national health system in the UK, your Canadian health care system, our Medicare system remain extremely popular today. People understand a good thing when they have it. In 19... In 2004, as I think all of you know, a poll conducted by the CBC named Tommy Douglas the greatest Canadian. Now I want to take you into what is going on politically in America and do it in a way that relatively few members of Congress will do. Because something very different and in a sense unprecedented is going on in the country and it is more than just Donald Trump. What we are looking at right now is a very powerful group of billionaires led by the Koch brothers. Anybody here hear of the Koch brothers? Well, learn about them. <laughs> because there are many people, including myself, who will tell you that this, these two brothers, who are worth about $90 billion, are more powerful politically in the United States than either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And the reason for that is they have developed their own extreme right-wing political network, which not only in a given campaign cycle, and we have congressional elections every two years, will contribute hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to elect right-wing candidates who represent the interest of the wealthy and the powerful. But above and beyond that, they establish think tanks, they establish chairs at universities throughout the country, they have significant influence over the media. And what is the agenda of this incredibly wealthy family? It is an agenda which says that government should play virtually no role in our lives, perhaps except for defense. That concepts like social security or public health or public education should be scrapped and privatized that we should move America back to where we were in the 1920s when working people had no protection as workers, where the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor had virtually no rights at all, that we should go back to a society where freedom was based on the amount of money that you had in your bank account. And they are spending enormous amounts of money. They have taken the Republican Party from what used to be what we would call a center-right party to a right-wing extremist party. A party that several months ago, if you can believe it, voted 
to throw some 30 million Americans off of the health insurance they currently have by making massive cuts to our health insurance programs and by ending the Affordable Care Act established by Barack Obama. Fortunately, literally by one vote, we were able to beat them back on five separate occasions. But they are back again. And I want to tell you about the budget because this is what they stand for. This is what the Koch brothers are paying for. Now, I want you to think about it. In the United States now, we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality. For 40 years, our middle class has been shrinking. We have 40 million people living in poverty at the same time as the wealthiest people are doing phenomenally well. That is the economic reality of America today. And what the Republican leadership is proposing and passed is a budget which says that we will provide over a 10-year period $1.9 trillion in tax breaks for the top 1%. It is a shame. It is a disgrace. And then they have a provision in there which would provide hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the top two-tenths of 1%, including the Koch brothers family, which would get a $30 billion tax break, not having to pay the estate tax after they died. And in that budget, they want to throw 15 million people off of health care by cutting Medicaid by a trillion dollars. They want to make massive cuts to federal aid, to education, to nutrition, and to needs of the elderly and the children. That is what happens when billionaires are able to buy a political party. Don't let it happen in Canada. And what that would mean if they got their way I mean, it's almost indescribable, and I think half of you won't believe me when I tell you what, in fact, it would mean. If you throw 15 million people off of health insurance, children will die who are sick. Kids with disabilities will not get the care that they need. We want, in America, to make public colleges and universities tuition-free. They want to make it more more difficult for our young people to get to college at a moment when the world is changing so rapidly and young people need more education. Let me just conclude my remarks by saying this. In the United States, the vast majority of the people, in fact, believe in a democratic and humane society. Right now, what we are taking on as a result of a disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision is a situation where billionaires are undermining our democracy and are effectively buying elections. Our job in the United States is to overturn Citizens United and establish a vibrant democracy of one person, one vote. And when we do that, we also have to be mindful of something else. And that in America today, as many of you may know, many Republican governors are working overtime to suppress the vote. We have in America one of the lowest voter turnouts of any major country on earth. Our job is to get more people to participate in the political process, and yet we have governors who are trying to make it harder for people of color, for young people, for poor people to participate. And we're going to take them on as well. Now, yesterday, uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful trip. And I want to 
thank all of those responsible for our ability to go to the hospitals and meet so many great physicians and administrators. And we learned a lot about your system and, and the extraordinary things that your system is doing. And there's so much to be learned. And we will take back what we learned here and what we know about the Canadian health care system to the United States Congress uh, and to the American people. And as the Premier mentioned a moment ago, we in the United States have got to ask a simple question. How does it happen that here in Canada, you provide health care to every man, woman, and child, and you do it at 50% of the cost that we spend on health care in the United States? And the answer is, to a significant degree, that we have a health care system not designed to provide quality care to all people in a cost-effective way, but frankly, a system designed to make billions in profit for the drug companies and the insurance companies. And the issue of the pharmaceutical industry, by the way, is not just an issue for the United States. It's an issue for you as well. Your Prices in Canada, depending on, obviously, the drug, are often 50% of what they are in the United States. And many years ago, I took a bunch of people from my state of Vermont across the border, go up to Montreal to buy medicine at a fraction of the cost we are paying in Vermont. But you are also paying some of the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And our job is to tell the pharmaceutical industry that they cannot continue to rip off the people of the United States, Canada, or any place else while they're making unbelievably excessive profits. And there is another area where I think uh, the United States and Canada are in the same boat, and it's not a good boat and that is regarding dental care. I can tell you that in the United States, uh, dental care is very, very expensive. There are many low-income people who basically, and children who cannot get to the dentist when they need. And any physician will tell you that when you talk about health care, dental care is part of health care, cannot be ignored. So let me thank uh, all of you for being here, thank the people who organized uh, this visit, and thank you for the values uh, that uh, this province and this country are showing to the world. They mean a lot to many of us. Thank you so much. I'm Marilyn Emery, and I'm the President and CEO of Women's College Hospital. It is my pleasure to introduce a colleague and a friend who has played a pivotal role in improving health care here at home and beyond our borders. At Women's College Hospital, we are on a mission to close gaps in our health care system. In 2013, we founded the Women's College Hospital Institute for Health System Solutions and Virtual Care. <laughs> Weave, as we call it, is a real-world solution, <clears throat> solutions engine tackling some of the toughest challenges in our healthcare system, from wait times to access to prescription medicines and the use of technology to improve care at home and in the community. Dr. Danielle Martin has helped to lead that work and we are so proud that her vision, policy expertise, and passion for equity 
have made her a leader in the debate over the future of health care in Canada. I hope you will all join me in welcoming Dr. Danielle Martin, a practicing family physician and vice president at Women's College Hospital to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, and Senator, of course, we're uh, extremely honored to have you here with us. And we had a wonderful time yesterday, uh, some wonderful dialogue with Canadian patients and healthcare providers um, about what's working in Canadian healthcare and what isn't. But of course, you knew a lot about the Canadian healthcare system before you came. Um, in the process of drafting the Medicare for All bill, I know that you and your colleagues learned even more. I'm curious to know what surprised you yesterday? What was unexpected? Well, one of the things that uh, surprised me was the degree to which both patients and physicians appreciated and understood the importance of getting money out of the care process. In other words, we talked to uh, some patients who had very serious medical problems. Is the mic not working? Who had... <laughs> who had some very serious health problems. And what everybody knows is that when you are sick, if you're diagnosed with heart disease, you need surgery or cancer, and you have to go through all of that difficult uh, therapeutic process, what you want to focus on is how you get well. And I think what the patients and the doctors said is that it was of enormous importance for patients not having to worry about how they're going to pay the bill. Imagine struggling with cancer and filling out all kinds of forms and wondering what happens if you leave the hospital $50,000 in debt and how you're going to be able to pay that is your family going bankrupt. Not only is that painful unto itself, it hinders your ability to recover and focus on your own needs. And doctors said the same thing. They said we can provide the therapy and the medicine that our patients need and not worry about having to get permission from the insurance companies or having to worry about whether our patient can afford that test. So from both the doctor's point of view and the patient's point of view, understanding that the goal is to make the patient well and not have to worry about how that patient is going to be able to afford the treatment, that is just an enormous step forward in, in providing good medicine. That's something I learned. Isn't it? So we know that, of course, the Canadian system is not perfect, but I think many Canadians, in a very polite way, take some umbrage to some of the myths that we hear propagated about Canada and the American healthcare debate. I'm wondering if you could tell us what is the most important myth to bust about the Canadian healthcare system and what can the people in this room do to help you uh, bring uh, facts to that conversation? Good question. Um, I was on a, uh, at a hearing in the Senate, and some senator, senator, said, you know, if you have health care as a right, it means that physicians are slaves now try to follow this logic. <laughs> Stay with me. Because if I have health care as a right, I can knock on your door at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you must provide health care to me at that moment. Therefore, you are a, literally a slave was the word used. So my question to the American physicians who were up there on the panel was whether or not they believed they were living in slavery. <laughs> you will not be surprised to know that they did not. <laughs> uh, the other issue is quality of care. Yeah, it's great to be able to provide quality of care. It's great to be able to provide health care to all people. Quality is substandard. Uh, waiting times are in terminal. People get ill, they can't get in to the doctor uh, when they need it. And again, I think what we all know, and you know is better than anybody who wrote a book on the subject, Canadian healthcare system is not 
perfect. It has its problems. But I think there are just a whole lot of very intentional lies and distortions. These are not misunderstandings. These are very intentional lies in order to try to convince the American people that the current dysfunctional system we have is the best that we can do. So, I mean, we have a room full of people here who, judging by their reactions, don't feel enslaved. Um, I would venture to say even perhaps feel liberated from uh, the, the worry that you have described about what will happen if any of us gets ill tomorrow. Uh, how can we help? I know that Canadians are, are well known throughout the world as gentle and kind people. Be a little bit louder. <laughs> And stand up and fight, stand up and fight for what you have achieved and defend it. Look, I'm in politics and I get criticized every day. I'm sure the Premier gets criticized every day. Nothing is perfect and people have different points of view about everything. But when you accomplish something significant, like guaranteeing health care to all people, stand up and defend that all over the world. Let me give you another example. And we're fighting for this, you know, making some a little bit of progress. In the United States of America today, there are women who are giving birth right now, today, and they will be forced to go back to work in four or five weeks because they need the income to take care of their family. It happens all over the United States. Now, here, as I understand it in Ontario nationally, if you have a baby, you get a year's, year's paid leave. Is that right? That is, again, an enormous accomplishment which allows a mom and a dad to bond with the baby, not force a mother to go back to work before she should. Stand up and defend that paid leave. Now, on all of these issues, raising the minimum wage to a living wage, pay equity for women, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, we are working hard, and in some cases, we are making good progress. But what is very important in the American debate is to have not only Canadians, but people all over the world standing up and saying health care is a right. When you have a baby, you have a right to stay home. If you work 40 hours a week, you should not live in poverty. And we need you to say those things so that those of us in the United States who are fighting these fights are not told, oh, what you're saying is it's too radical. It can't happen. We want to join you in saying, well, it is happening, actually, in countries all over the world. How radical an idea is it, for example? Something that we're pushing in the United States. I know you're pushing here. To say that in a world where technology is changing every day, where the education system must change with that technology, if we're going to be able to get the good paying new jobs that are being developed, how radical an idea is it to say that we must extend the concept of public education from first grade to 12th grade through higher education. It's not a radical idea. So we need your help. Stand up. Fight for your country to do even better, but defend with pride what you have achieved. So I have a final question that's quite linked to that, actually, and it relates to the process of making change, because it's hard. Uh, what you are up against is hard, and uh, I must say, even here in Canada, the changes that we need to make to improve our health and social systems feel hard to many of us at times. You know, the inclusion of prescription medications, uh, universal pharmacare, dental care, um, we're all on a journey here, and the change is not easy. 
How do you think we're going to be able to achieve it? The journey is not easy, and the journey never has been easy for human rights and for human dignity. And what I worry very much about, which we don't talk about for, again, obvious reasons, is that in my country and in many parts of the world, we are moving away from democracy into kleptocracy and oligarchy. And that is, in country after country, you are seeing a small handful of people control not only the economies, but also the politics of that country. And what we need to do all over the world is develop strong grassroots movement. We need to tell every person, every working person, every young people that you are sorely mistaken if you think that politics is not important to your lives. That it is absolutely imperative that you be involved. If you want a climate that is livable, you've got to be involved in politics because there are very, very powerful special interests who could care less about the planet. If you want to expand and protect what you have in healthcare or in education, there are people out there in every country in the world who think that it is more important to give tax breaks to the richest people in this country than to provide health care or education or economic rights for working people. And what we need to do is take those oligarchs on. That is the fight of the moment. So we can argue amongst ourselves, what is the best way forward on health care? What is the best way forward for the economy? What is the best way, you know, how do we have the great universities that we want? All of that needs serious debate and discussion. But I will tell you with 100% certainty, there are people who are enormously powerful, who have more wealth than you can dream of, who could care less about your lives, about your children, about your parents. They want it all economically. They want it all politically. And we in the United States, Canada, all over this world, we have got to stand together and tell these oligarchs that this planet belongs to all of us and not just to a handful.